Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Good point. I told her where I was stopping last night. She's like, oh, that's an ominous name for a town. <laughs> Never thought of it that way if you think of it. Black River Falls. The place where people go to disappear. It's actually a really nice town. And they got a really nice Flying J here. It's like, a, it's not one of the regular ones too. It's sort of like, uh, it must have been something else at one point, And then it got transformed into a Flying J a long time ago. I've been driving for over 11 years over the road now and this has always been a Flying J since I've been on the road so I don't know when this transition happened but uh, it's a really nice big lot. we got a boss shop here. You get your truck repaired, get it serviced. Looks like they got a washout bay over there. Behind this guy. And it's pretty much exactly a day's drive from Winnipeg. So if I'm leaving home, going to the US East Coast or Wisconsin or Illinois, anywhere down there, Black River Falls is pretty much a perfect day's drive. So a lot of guys from Winnipeg will stop here for night after on their first night out on the road. We need to get going. I want to make it to Bemidji this afternoon yet and get loaded today yet. Trailer is attached. Fantastic. So from Black River Falls to Bemidji, it's just under 600 kilometers, six hours of driving. I guess that'd be about 360 miles. It's gonna be a good day fueled up here for about 115 gallons, US gallons yesterday. 400 and some liters. Price was $3.88 US per gallon. That equaled $1.37 Canadian per liter. Last I checked, fuel prices in Manitoba for diesel are still sitting at about $1.95 per liter. So it's considerably cheaper down here. Again, I know I sound like a broken record saying that, but like I've said over and over, I mean, fuel in the US has always been cheaper, always. That's a fact. But it hasn't been this much cheaper. <laughs> they got some cheap juice down here. Don't get me wrong, it could still go cheaper. It's, it's still high compared to where it's been in the past, right? But comparing to Canada and comparing to the rest of the world, it's practically free. In 100 meters, take the entrance to the left on I-94 West. I really don't like comparing our fuel prices to Europe and other parts of the world though. Sort of a little pet peeve of mine. It, there is no comparison. Uh, Europe, 
is completely different than North America in many ways. You know, they drive eight hours and they're in a different country. Here, we drive eight hours and we're not even halfway through a province or state. The distances to drive are much, much longer. Everything is much more spread apart. So we probably spend the same amount, like dollar-wise, as the Europeans do in fuel. But we go a lot further. That's just my opinion though, I mean. Fancy don't hit me vest. We're here. We made it. I don't see anybody around here yet, but I'm going to go into the office and figure out what's going on. And I've got to load up, I believe, 30 feet of lumber. Let's see. What does my message say here? 30 feet. Yeah. And I have about 45 feet left on my trailer. I just have those two eight foot skids on the front. So it should work out just fine. Oh, here comes a guy right now. Right on. That's what we picked up yesterday. I just gotta wait for him to come and put it on the trailer. We can tie it down, button it up and go. Might even get across the border today yet. You guys are gonna love this. <laughs> this is the whole load. That's it. We were told 30 feet. Well, I guess it probably would have been 30 feet if we didn't stack them up. But why use the whole trailer if we don't have to? Just stack them up. Now I have an extra 25 feet available if they find anything for me on the way home. It's late in the day, probably won't find anything, but if something suddenly pops up and it's like, hey, 20 feet of freight, we need it moved to Winnipeg right now, I can swing by there and pick it up. I'm delivering those two pallets at the front that I picked up in Bartlett, Illinois to Altona, Manitoba tomorrow. These I'm bringing to our yard and then I'm grabbing a step deck and I'm pulling that over to Kenora to pick up another load. It's going to be another busy day tomorrow. So maybe this weekend or whenever I'm actually home for a little bit of time, it might be, you know, when I'm actually taking time off for the baby, uh, I'm going to have to run over to, uh, oops, run over to KK Penner or uh, West End Tire, Cal Tire, all the tire shops I can think of and see if they have a used tire that matches like my tread depth on my other tires. And then I'm gonna run a used tires with my other seven drives until they're all worn down. Keep these two good drives that I put on last week. And then I just have to buy six instead of eight next fall. That's the plan. It's the best uh, situation I can come up with it because these tires have actually grown on me i wasn't sure if i'd like the good years but you know they've grown on me but the kind of work i do and the kind of terrain i drive in 
They're going to be really good tires. Really good tread. Really good tire. We'll see how they do. I already got these two, so why not make the most of it? Alright, so this lumber's got to be tarped. So I gotta quickly tarp this load. Done. And that's how you tarp a load, ladies and gentlemen. The load I'm picking up tomorrow in Kenora, I've gotta tarp them old school. So let's enjoy this moment while we can. Got to tighten it all up. It's a little chillier, chillier up here than in Chicago. Snow everywhere. I took the winter front off of my truck while I was down in Illinois because it was almost plus 10 at times, like plus five Celsius. So I didn't need the winter front. I got back up here, I had to put the winter front back on. There's no real set like time or science to exactly when you have to put it on. I just put it on around freezing point. When it gets down to zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, I slap the winter front on the truck just to, you know, keep her cozy, keep her warm a little bit. But I have all the vents open. Once it gets down below minus 15 to around minus 20 Celsius, I'll close up two of the vents, and once it gets down to minus 30, I close them all up. That's the way I do it. You won't learn that in driver school. That's just sort of teach their own you know it's not a requirement to have a winter front it's just if you want to treat your truck real nice and you know, something you do to be nice to it all right we're loaded up we're buttoned up let's go if i get cleared at the border today yet uh i'll be there at like seven o'clock tonight in altona waiting to unload in the morning Am I in like a rut or something? What happened there? That was weird. I guess my tires were a little warm and they, they melted into the snow a little bit. What was that all about? All right, maybe it was soft snow and I just sunk in while I was being loaded. Off we go. Hi ho, hi ho. Still at work, and here we go. That doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. Truck entrance. It's also a truck exit. It is now. It's the only entrance and exit for trucks on the yard, so. I can feel a little more weight in my trailer now, for sure. My gauge is at 50 PSI on my drives. So I put the majority of the weight on my drives so that I have good traction and a smoother ride. I didn't want it on my trailer, obviously, because then I'd be carrying the weight and uh, it'd be a bumpy ride and I'd have less traction if it starts to snow all of a sudden. After we unload, oops, after we unload uh, in the morning, like I said, we go straight to our yard, drop this trailer, grab an empty step deck, rush over to Kenora, grab a load, and that's gonna take us down to Brainerd, Minnesota, which is actually right in this area right here. So I'm coming right back down to this area. And then I have another reload that's not lined up yet, but the ball's rolling on it. They are keeping me busy. I ask them to keep me busy. And be very careful what you ask for, because you might get it. Continue on this road for 134 kilometers. 
I'm happy though. I'm really happy. Like I was saying earlier, I have uh, eight and a half weeks or so until I'm parking the truck for a few weeks. And I still don't know exactly how long that's gonna be. I'm gonna say right now, like four weeks for sure. I took off two weeks before the baby is due. Uh, I've told you all this already, but for the new people or for the people who might've missed that, during those two weeks, I'm gonna make sure that the uh, nursery is ready. Make sure we are ready and prepared. Make sure Britt has everything she needs. She's gonna be late term uh, or in the, the end of her third trimester. So she's gonna need some help getting around and uh, you know taking care of stuff. And then after the baby's born, if it comes on its due date of April 1st, which is my birthday, uh, then at least another two weeks after because of it being our first child, uh, I want to make sure that we know what we're doing. All right, we're mid thirties already. Like we're not kids having kids and we're pretty confident that we'll be just fine. But you know, it's our first one. We got a, we got a lot to learn and I want to be there for it. And it all depends how the birth goes. Britt might need me at home to help her with stuff. Uh, if it's a little bit more of a difficult birth, I might have to be there for an extra little while. We're all gonna play it by ear after that. So I'm saying four to six weeks. Get ready for some home time content, some uh, some baby content. And then once we're uh, you know comfortable that we got a good beat on things that we that we got it. <laughs> Then I'll uh, slowly start getting back on the road. That will probably be mid-April to early May. No, mid to late April when I get back on the road. So the vlogs will be a little different throughout the end of March and April. Uh, heads up, well in advance, so nobody gets all surprised that there's no truck trucking for, for a little while. All right, it, it just heads up. I'm gonna be taking a little break from the truck in April. This is Grand Forks, North Dakota. Coming in on Highway 2, we're gonna merge on to Interstate 29 North. And unfortunately, I haven't gotten any confirmation that my load is cleared for the border. So I'm gonna go right up to Pembina, the border town there. They have a gas tracks truck stop. I'll park there and I'll check in in the morning. I don't need to go further than that anyways. I've already been driving for a full day. Well, mostly a full day. But who knows, maybe we'll get confirmation by the time we get there. I'm still about an hour away. 45 minutes or so. My point is if I have to stay there at gas tracks, I'm fine with that. Altona, my delivery, is just inside the border anyway, so even if I get my clearance first thing in the morning, I'll run over, drop those two skids off, and it won't really affect my day tomorrow. I'll be fine. That's what life on the road is all about, though. You're constantly trip planning. Trip planning, making sure that you're going to get to where you need to be on time. It's all that consumer math that I took in high school put to good use. I never went through pre-calculus or algebra or all that, or what's the, what's the course called again? The, the, the higher standard of math. I just went through consumer math and it turns out that was good because that's what I really needed for my, for my job and my career. Why has this guy got his high beams on in my mirror? Well, what's he want? What's he flashing? I've noticed some people, uh, I've heard one person say that they think that it's normal that when you're about to pass a semi, you flash your brights a little bit. Uh, please don't do that. That's the most annoying, irritating thing on, in the, on the whole planet at night. Any high beams in my mirror just puts me in a bad mood. 
sometimes I mean like cars, when they pass you, they'll give you a little flicker of the lights. I don't know if that's a European thing or not, but Europeans love to flash brights at people, either to tell them to get out of the way or, you know, to come back into the lane or that they're gonna pass someone. They're always flashing their lights at everybody, right? It's, I don't do that. <laughs> it's a cultural thing, I guess. Sometimes to notify, like when a semi-truck passes me, the way I let them know to come back into the lane when it's safe is I turn my lights off and then on, never the high beams. Because I know that that irritates me. Usually you're just passing somebody, right? And you're about to turn into the lane, you've already made up your mind, you're gonna come over, you look in the mirror and POW! They nail you with their high beams right in the retinas. Thanks for the purple spots, buddy. Oh, I, 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 I actually really hate that behavior, but it's, it's, it is pretty common. People do that. It's, I wish it would stop, but you know, every time I mention it, people get all defensive about it. But I have to flash the lights. It's the courteous thing to do. Oh yeah, my eyeballs hurt now. That wasn't very courteous, if you ask me. But you know, I have this little button. You push this thing down, whoop, and my lights go off and then on. Does the exact same thing, and I would argue is even more courteous and more polite. Huh? What do you think? I haven't made that argument in a while. I used to talk about it all the time. You notice it more in Eastern Canada. It's a big habit there, flashing people's high beams in their mirrors and stuff. My, that is my all-time, all-time pet peeve. North Dakota. Slide right on North Washington Street, USA 1PL. Be legendary. You got it, North Dakota. You got it. Karen, I'm waiting. Crossing border, entering North Dakota. Good job, good job. Get you a treat. And so ends another great day on the road. Wonderful. We got over 900 kilometers behind us close to 600 miles. It was a good full day. I'm sitting here in Pembina, North Dakota, a mile away from the Canadian border. I didn't get confirmation that my load had cleared. I don't need to cross tonight anyway. All I was gonna do was go 15 minutes on that side of the border and park there in Latalia, Manitoba. So I parked here instead. Either way, I have to stop for my 10 hours because tomorrow, once I drop those two skids off in Altona, I bring that lumber and the trailer to our yard. We got one of our city drivers is gonna deliver that lumber for me. And then I grab a step deck, like, I, like I've told you already, I go to Kenora, grab that load, and that load's going to Brainerd, Minnesota. So in order to go back into the US, I have to stop for my full 10 consecutive hours. If I was just staying in Canada, and if I could cross the border and stop in Latelier, well, I, I would only have to stop for eight hours, and then I can keep moving, right? But in order to enter back into the US, my logs have to be legal for the U.S. On U.S. soil, you obey U.S. law. On Canadian soil, you obey Canadian law. They're kind of similar, but at the same time, our hours of service are completely different. I've, I've gone into them before. I should make a, a video specifically explaining them because they, they make it so confusing. Like I know in the U.S. there's a split hour rule where you can have seven hours in the sleeper berth and then account for the other three hours throughout your day. But my e-log doesn't seem to understand how that works because sometimes I'll stop for seven consecutive hours in the US and my e-log suddenly says, hey, you have hours to drive. You can now drive. Other times I'll stop for seven hours and it'll be like, no, you need your full 10 consecutive hours before you can drive, Trevor Josh. What are you thinking? Go back to bed. But in Canada, like after eight hours, you have your full 13 hours of driving available and you have 16 hours to get that done in. But you need those other two hours because you still need 10 hours off duty within your 24 hour period. So you can stop for eight hours for night, but you're gonna need to account for two more hours throughout your day in increments of no less than 30 minutes. So you could have like four 30 minute breaks, which would equal two hours which would add on to the eight hours that you stopped, which now makes it 10 hours off duty within your 16 hour window, which now resets your clock so you can have another 16 hour window tomorrow and have 13 hours to drive. 
if you want them. But in the U.S., like sometimes, like I know there's a split hour rule. I read about I read about it on the internet, and the internet never lies, never. Seven hours off, you should be able to get going as long as you account for the other three hours somewhere else in your day. I don't know if it's in half hour intervals. I don't know how that works. I always just stick with the 10 consecutive hours before I start moving again, and then I don't get in trouble. I don't know about that split hour rule. Maybe you can let me know in the comments section what that's all about. I just stopped for my 10 hours in the US. But in the US, after you stop for 10 consecutive hours, well, you, now you have a new 14 hour day before you, before you have to stop working. And uh, you have 11 hours of that can be driving, and another like hour of that can be on duty, not driving, but you have to have a half hour break, a 30 minute break, you must. The United States government says you have to stop for a half hour break, you can't work more than eight hours, no, you can't drive more than eight hours without a half hour break. And then you get the rest of your day, and you have to stop for 10 hours, and then you can start over with a new day. Thank you for watching today. I appreciate that. Hit the like button if you like my videos. And uh, if you don't like my videos, double click the dislike button. It's very important that you double click. The two clicks makes it count. All right. <laughs> don't forget to subscribe, guys. I'll uh, see you tomorrow for another video. It's going to be fun.